now they're going to and they're going to change it because it did feel like the angle like on Monday this the they you know Austin Theory was talking about how he was going to go there and he was going to make sure that you know like Pat McAfee might attack Vince and he was going to protect him and everything and then nothing happened Pat you know Austin Theory doesn't even go there then they just announced this match and Vince just goes you know whatever so um but I mean as far as even as late as the day of the show I mean, I know Creative was still thinking that it was Austin Theory. I mean, I, don't, I mean Vince in the spot. So I don't know if it changes to Vince in the you know later, or they just changed in the sense because maybe maybe they don't want to advertise something that they're not going to deliver because obviously you know Vince can't do anything. And Austin Theory is going to end up you know being the smoke and mirrors anyway. So um, I guess we'll wait for you know a week or two to see, or we'll probably actually we'll probably know by Monday. You know, um, if this was just a swerve, you know, the, if the first announcement or if they've just changed it to the match it was going to be. But, you know, I mean, the big thing was, you know, they wanted Vince and they wanted Austin because they got a lot of tickets to sell. And Pat McAfee against Austin Theory is not going to be selling a lot of tickets. And Steve Austin and Kevin Owens is, you know, they will have a confrontation but it is not clear if that will be a match or not anymore because it's up to it's essentially up to Austin at this point. They want the match. Uh, they thought they had the match, and you know Steve. You know there's a reason he hasn't wrestled for 19 years, and uh, you know um, I just know that as of Friday he had not agreed to do the match, even though it was on the books. Now it's it's on the books as a confrontation. So that's that that's what's going on there with that one and obviously Sami Zayn and Johnny Knoxville is not for the Intercontinental title because Ricochet won the title um, not sure what's going to happen with uh, if Ricochet is even going to be defending the title on the show um, and then um, they've set up nothing for the Usos but I guess maybe that starts next week because they beat the Viking Raiders clean they, there's no reason to bring that back and I'm sure that the men's tag team, the raw men's tag team title thing, will probably, be, you know, come out of what happens on uh, Monday night. And um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else as far as uh, Mania goes. I mean, that's that's pretty much it. Um, yeah. Probably, so, so, so as far as Cody Rhodes, since we already brought him up earlier, um, his status has changed in theory, I mean, he was on the books in WWE. They had creative laid, laid out for him. Um, they still thought on Friday that they had creative laid out for him. And then um, now it's very uncertain. They don't know what's going on with Cody Rhodes. They're not sure. So I don't, you know, we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. But yeah, it's up in the air um, they don't know. They don't know. They thought they had him. And now, you know, they, it's not like it's dead. It's not like they think they don't have him, but they're not sure. So that's the situation with, uh, Cody. Hmm. Um, you know, I mean, as far as, I mean, everyone in the world thinks that, you know, Cody runs ring of honor or something. And I suppose there's ways to do that, to do that angle and everything like that. But, you know, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see how this all plays out. Vince and Oliver Luck. Okay, so the trials go on July 11th, or unless it gets delayed. Um, but a lot happened in the last couple of weeks when it comes to the trial. So essentially, um, for those who are not aware, Oliver Luck was the guy who Vince chose to be the commissioner and CEO of the XFL. He hired him in 2018 for a five-year deal for $35 million uh, over the five years, so $7 million a year, essentially. And so he started there in 2018 for and worked there for a while before the season started, you know, before they started in 2020. And he was paid... $11.2 million for his work for the XFL. And then the XFL folds and he's fired. Now, to, 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 the key to the Oliver Luck story, as we've talked about in the past, is that Oliver Luck um, negotiated a lot into his contract and um, because of the idea that, hey, 
what if this only goes for a year? Even though Vince insisted that, you know, he's committed to three years, no matter what. Even if it goes terribly, he's committed to three years. And then he pulls out in whatever it was, five weeks, um, you know, claiming the pandemic. But, um, you know, he gave up. I mean, it was the pandemic didn't help matters. But, you know, Vince just got whatever it was. Vince got tired of it, you know, because everybody else that started companies had to take hits during the pandemic. Um, and I don't know of any sports leagues that folded, you know, and AEW started, you know, not that much earlier, you know, and, you know, they, you know, they didn't put us, I mean, they didn't lose the money that, that Vince did, you know, I mean, Vince was out there with the idea that he was going to, he was willing to lose what was it, two or $300 million. And, and he did not, he, he, he lost a lot, but it was nothing like that um, because he pulled out. So anyway, Oliver Luck's contract is that Vince, you know, if the league folded, it was a contract with Vince McMahon, unlike everyone else in the XFL that, you know, got screwed when it was declared bankruptcy. Like even Coachman, who was really upset because he thought him and Vince were good friends. And, you know, Coachman was owed like 20 grand and they just bankrupted the league. And Vince didn't pay like all these people in all these communities or anything, you know, that, that he had owed money to. He just bankrupted the league and said, we're bankrupt or not bankrupted, but um, closed it down and filed for bankruptcy. So, you know, Vince didn't even pay people, you know, whatever. So, but with Oliver Luck, his contract was XFL and Vince. So Vince owed him the whole $35 million. And then Vince fired him the day before um, to get out of paying that. But Oliver Luck also negotiated into his contract that, you know, he could lose the contract if he was fired, but there were certain terms of, of firing. And the basic terms were that, if he did something worth firing, they had to inform him of it. They had to written, you know, basically uh, inform him of it in writing. And he had to be able to, and he had to be given a chance to fix it. So that's a very important point right here. So um, WWE, um, in their counterclaim, and they've in fact sued Oliver too. So it's back and forth lawsuit. Um, they claim that... Um, the grounds of him being fired was, number one, he used his uh, XFL cell phone to make personal calls and visit websites that had nothing to do with, um, you know, league business. So he's using his, his business phone, business thing. And, you know, a lot of these calls were to his wife and to his brother-in-law. Um, but, um, and, and he claimed, and as far as his brother-in-law, you know, works for a, a you know, um, a, a company that they were that XFL was doing business with, um, and he claimed that the stuff with his brother-in-law was part of doing business, and they, you know, Vince claims that it was not part of doing business with the company that his brother-in-law works for that worked for the XFL. But whatever, he did that, and um, you know, he clearly he did visit some websites using that phone that were not for business. Okay, now now. Yeah, I know you're kind of snickering, but um, that's one of the claims. And then the one claim was that when the pandemic hit, he went home, which in fact he did. And so he was not available. The problem was, is that, you know, and he never talked, he, you know, he didn't talk to Vince. But for them to fire him, they would have to say, dude, you need to get back here right now or or you need to be, you know, coming to some meetings or, or, or doing the meetings, you know, virtual right you know like whatever and they never did that they just fired him so he had to be you know they had to inform him and they didn't inform him um and then as far as like with the cell like the the phone stuff they didn't know any of this because the whole phone thing became you know whatever afterwards and then the big one which was um antonio callaway was um you know vince told him no criminals in this league you know no criminals and um, nobody with, you know, bad reputations. I want a clean league. And um, there were two guys that Oliver Luck wanted to sign that uh, Vince said no to, who the WWE's claim is had less of a record than Antonio Callaway. So he signs Antonio Callaway. And actually, Basil DeVito goes to Vince and just goes to this guy. You know, he was, he was charged with... Um, um, you know, sexual uh, assault when he was in college. 
Now he was he, now there was never a criminal charge against him, but there was a complaint made by the woman to the school, and the school investigated and and suspended him from the football team. And then when the investigation was over, they cleared him. Um, but he did have um, credit card fraud. So, I mean, there is that. And he was suspended twice for the NFL for failing the drug test. So, um, you know, by Vince's bylaws, he probably should not have hired him. Um, and Vince found out, you know, Basil DeVito told him that, hey, you know, we, what happened was when the word got out that he was that he was hired, that's when, you know, with social media and everything, hey, you said you're going to hire no criminals. This guy, when he was in college, you know, he did some bad shit in theory, even if though he's cleared one, the other one he wasn't necessarily cleared of. So, um, you know, Vince calls up Oliver Luck and says, fire the guy. So Oliver Luck calls up the coach of the team and says, we're going to have to fire the guy. And the guy, and, and the coach says, uh, do you want me to do it before practice or do you want me to do it after practice? And it's like, ah, you know, as soon as practice is over, fire him. Okay, so then they go to practice and Callaway gets injured. And because of the nature of Callaway's contract, um, you know, it's a workman's comp thing. He had to be put on injured reserve. They could not fire him because he was injured while, um, you know, while working for them, um, you know, injury, you know, basically in, in practice. So it ended up costing the league $200,000. Um, between Callaway's salary for the year and his rehab costs and things like that. So that was the other charge. So now anyway, what happened was the judge threw out the cell phone thing, you know, just said, this isn't, no, you know, this is, you can't, you can't uh, do it over that. And WWE wasn't happy with that. And they may appeal if they lose the case over that. Um, they threw out the, um, thing about him not being there because again there was no written thing they did not throw out the callaway thing so the lawsuit will essentially comes down to if the callaway thing was worthy of being fired now of course the um lux claim is is that they never told him anything until you know weeks later actually months later they fire him and that's one of the things but they had all those months to tell him which they never did and you know so that's Essentially, where the case is now, Callaway, um, not Callaway, but um, Oliver Luck, what happened with him, the, he, he got censured by the judge because when they were having hearings in front of the judge, he claimed, okay, so he claimed this is back to the cell phone. He and his, and his lawyer both claimed that they had never tinkered with the cell phone. And it was found out that they, in fact, did, uh, as, as soon as the, um, or very shortly after he was fired, they did. Uh, delete the browser history of the cell phone, which is, but WWE in fact found out because when you examine the phone, you can examine, you know, whatever. But he did try to delete the browser history and he did delete some text messages. His claim is the text messages he deleted were like these spam text messages, you know, the things that we all get that we delete. Um, so he did delete those. He said he did delete those. Um, and then they did delete the browser history of some of the websites that he visited. Um, but the fact is, is that Lux said he never did. And the judge's basic thing was, is, um, then later, you know, when it came out that he did, he said, he just didn't remember, you know, it's like, I, I didn't remember I did this. Um, and the judge was like, you know, when you said that you didn't do it, um, you should have had enough, you know, cause you said adamantly that you didn't do it. Um, even if you forgot, which would be okay because it's not that big of a deal. But if you forgot, you should have at least examined it before you tell us, you know, that you didn't do it. So he is going to be fined a certain amount um, for that. So he was censured. Um, so anyway, that's the case. It's going to be all about, um, you know, whether it was justifiable to fire um, him over the not firing Callaway when Vince wanted him to because he, he waited till after the practice, so that's there's a twenty three point eight million, and, and in, in going there, and there could be a settlement, but from what I gather, because essentially this is an all or nothing thing, it's like either either um, Oliver Luck wins the case and gets his twenty three point eight million, or he loses the case and gets nothing, and um, 
so that's what's you know that's basically what's, where it's where the where the lawsuit is. All right, uh, AW Memorial Day show, which in fact we're going to be going to. We're going to have a convention. There's all sorts of information up uh, wrestlingobserver.com, my Twitter at Brian Alvarez. But uh, AW show has already broken the one million dollar mark. Yeah, they did not sell out first day. They're at about twelve thousand five hundred out of fourteen thousand. So there's they're probably selling out, but it's the uh, first. Um, it's the first time AEW's ever hit the one million mark. They did, I think, nine hundred. They did nine hundred sixty thousand for the um, Arthur Ashe Stadium show. So they've broken their record. It is the second time in his, the history of wrestling that a company, other than the WWE, in um, I believe in the U.S. or Canada, has ever hit a million. Um, WWE has on many occasions uh, hit a million, many pay-per-views. They've done it even, they may have even done it on some house shows um, in, in the United States, maybe some big garden shows and stuff. Maybe even tonight, as a matter of fact, um, depending on, because uh, the garden prices are so high. But um, the only other one would have been the sellout of the garden, well, again, with high prices, which was the Ring of Honor and New Japan show in 2019 which did, I think it was 1.1 million. So this will top that. This, so this will end up, once those, you know, once they're done selling the rest of these tickets, and it's two months away, right? Um, three months away. So they're going to sell, they'll sell the 2,500 tickets. Um, or 1,500, wait, 12,500, 14,000, sell 1,500 tickets. They'll sell the 1,500 tickets. Um, they will break that the rec- that that number. So it will be the largest grossing uh, non WWE show ever in the United States or Canada. Um, this the one tomorrow's pay per view um, had lower prices in a much smaller building. You know, it's they're they're at a little like I think it's eight thousand one hundred and twenty seven tickets. I think is for tomorrow's show or total in the building, and then this one will be you know probably you know fifteen thousand in the building, fourteen thousand paid type of number. Um, but you know when it, when it it does sell out, so um, yeah, and then we're going to be doing uh, sweet party and uh, Texas Day Brazil. Texas Day, so dinner with everyone. Dinner with everyone. There's a sweet party on Saturday night. We're going to do, be doing our our usual Q and A's um, there, or a Q and A there. And there's also ways to get. Some are they, all the tickets gone? Are those all sold? Or I don't even know. I don't even know where it all stands. I don't think they're all gone yet. Okay, so this is because you know all the good seats are gone. I mean, the only seats that are left are bad seats. So if there's any, if you want to get good seats at like the at like at not at scalper prices, um, there might be a few left. I don't know how many, but there's there might be a few. Yeah, head to my Twitter at Brian Alvarez. Everything is up there or uh, the front page of WrestlingObserver.com. Or just go to, uh, let's see what the, we had an easy URL. I'll get it for you here in a few minutes, everybody. But uh, for sure, you can just go to everyone's Twitter, the front page of the site, and find it. So the uh, Revolution show is tomorrow. Five-hour show. So I already know the complaints ahead of time. Actually, actually, probably four hours, 45 minutes. They added another match. They're going to do... Usually the buy-in is a one-match deal in 30 minutes. They're doing three buy-in matches. They added uh, at the last minute the um, Eric Redbeard and uh, Pac and Dark Pentagon or Penta, Pentagon Oscuro or Penta Oscuro, whatever the name is exactly that he's using, against, um, you know, the House of Black, you know, Malachi Black, Brody King, and Buddy Matthews. And that's, like, going to probably be a great match. I mean, we already had a, you know... I mean, this is one of the deepest shows ever. And they just added another one. So, anyway, that's... Yeah, long night. So, the so it's a one-hour buy-in and then a uh, four-hour show. Three hours and 45 minutes. Three hours, 45 minutes, and one yeah, hour so that's buy-in. about usual. No, no, no. They, they usually go... Um, it's, it's a half hour longer than usual. I seem to recall they usually ended about eight forty, eight forty-five. No, but they start at seven thirty. Mm-hmm. So this is the usually they're starting at seven Eastern. So they're starting a half hour earlier. They're going to end it. Yeah, they're going to end at the exact. You know. Yes, but if you don't watch the buy-in, this is the usual time. 
Yeah, but they're promoting. I mean, these are real matches. It isn't like they're, you know what I mean? It's not like like that six-man tag. I mean, that could be, you know, I mean, on paper, that's a great match. I mean, look, anytime you have Pac and Pentagon and, you know, Malachi Black and Brody, you know, those are, that, that's a pay-per-view match. I mean, even if it's in the pre-show. And then the other ones are what it's it's Chris Danlander and Layla Hirsch, which has been promoted on TV and it's a match. And then Hook and QT, you know, which, you know, will probably be, you know, five minutes or so, maybe even even less. But it's it's, you know, I mean, Hook's one of the more over guys as far as, you know, cool factor and everything they got right now. So that's the buy in. Then we got uh, Jade Cargill, Ty Conti for the TBS title. Andrade, Matt Hardy, and Isaiah versus Darby, Sammy, and Sting in a tornado match. Jurassic Express, Red Dragon, and the Bucks in a three-way for the tag titles. Moxley and Danielson, Jericho and Kingston. Keith Lee, Orange Cassidy, Powerhouse Hobbs, Ricky Starks, Wardlow, and Christian in a uh, Face of the Revolution ladder match for a title shot. Britt Baker, Thunder Rosa, CM Punk, MJF, and Adam Page versus Adam Cole is the main event for the title. Yeah, Page and, uh, I mean, um, Punk and... MJF dog collar match, you know, trying to recreate the Roddy Piper Greg Valentine match from Starkey '83. Uh, of course, Roddy Piper is the hero for MJF and CM Punk, so that's probably why they probably. I'm I'm guessing that that you know that's where the dog collar. Well, I know it. That's where the dog collar match comes from. Is from the fact that they both idolize Roddy Piper, and this is their Starkey '83 match. By the way, the uh, website. FRWonline.com slash Vegas. What could be easier than that? That's so you can get all the information about the uh, Q&A, dinner, brunch, group tickets to the AEW shows, and uh, everything else. So go quick, because they're, uh, they won't be around long. FRWonline.com slash Vegas. All right, uh, for those who haven't heard the uh, Brian Danielson interview yet. Yeah, I mean, we did two-hour interview this morning with... Um brian danielson and uh it was tremendous it was actually one of the more fun interviews um we ever did it was funny because we were all joking because a lot of most of the interview is wrestling but a lot of the interview is not wrestling um he was talking about different books that he's been reading different things he's learned from different books we talked about you know playing outside as opposed to playing on your cell phone we talked and you know we talked about um you know, mental, you know, depression and social media, you know, and, and, you know, just the fact, you know, from Hannah Kimura and even a little bit of with Jade Cargill and all the stuff that she gets and everything like that. And, um, just like a lot of people, you know, and I mean, I kind of talked about it already, you know, but, you know, there's the good and the bad and, and, um, you know, he kind of joked that, you know, he, you know, a lot of his social media is not him. You know, it's his manager, which is, is the, you know, he basically just said that, which is the case. And, um, but, you know, we talked about a horrible person. You think so? And subjecting his manager to social media. It's terrible. That's what his manager's there for. Oh, man. Yeah, but his manager he, he pro- should be walking in nature. Yeah, but, um, yeah, we talked about, like, all kinds of different subjects that we both were thinking, oh, my God, you know, like, people might, I was thinking, like, people are going to go, okay, we love 90 minutes of the interview, but the other 30 minutes, it's like, what the hell were you doing, right? You weren't talking about wrestling at all. But it seems that people really liked the other 30 minutes. Now, I liked it. I thought it was a great conversation. But, you know, like, when I would talk to somebody like him, it, it's often not about wrestling, you know, I mean, it's mostly, but it's not always, you know, so therefore it's just kind of what it veered into. And it wasn't like I came in with any plans other than uh, to ask him about the uh, King of Indie show that you and I went to 22 years ago. It's where we actually met, as a matter of fact. That's right. Yeah. In person. Um, well, well, we met before the yes, show. Our, our in-person meeting. Our first in-person meeting was... The day of the first King of Indies, right? Yes. Before the show. Yeah. So, so, um, but we talked about King of Indies and, and everything because I had some family that wanted to make sure to ask him about King of Indies, which we did in the Nick Bockwinkle story, which many of you know, but if you don't, we told the whole Nick Bockwinkle story and, and everything like that. And, um, but yeah, we talked about, you know, so when we asked why he chose, <laughs> to go to AEW over WWE, he said, because of his family and because 
he could bleed. He wanted to bleed. Not all the time, but he wanted to be able to. And he told Vince, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's like, that's not the exact reason. I mean, a lot of it is, he said, like, he thought, you know, which is, you know, which is what, you know, he, he, he wanted to do what he thought would be the best thing for wrestling as a whole. Because money-wise, he was going to make money either way. So that was his determination. But when Vince asked him, why are you going? And he goes, because I want to bleed. And Vince goes, well, I can't give you that. Which was so funny because hours later, right after we talked, you know, we can't, we can't let you bleed. Brock Lesnar's out there bleeding. Yep. What a crazy irony. Yeah, it was it was mm. it was crazy irony. But we went through a lot of different subjects. Um, you know, obviously talked a lot about the the pay per view match with Moxley, which in fact is the winner of the Bruiser Brody Award and the winner of the Brian Danielson Award. Brian Danielson winning his own award this year. So best brawler against best technical wrestler. Um, you know, and the match will probably be a combination of both. We talked about Zack Saber and um, his ideas for that match. He had mentioned, this was an interesting one, that he and John Moxley and two other men, he would not say who they were. I think I know who one of them is. Um, and it would be someone who was just out of contract with WWE, so you all know who I mean by that. I believe he's one of them. I could be wrong. But anyway, two other people talked about how they all want to do G1 together, not necessarily this year, because Brian said, like, you know, he wants to go to Japan, but um, he doesn't want to go until fans can sure boo. He said even though he, he said he actually loved working at the Thunderdome and working at the Performance Center before they had fans, and he said he, he loved working with no fans, but I guess he doesn't want to go to Japan for fans that are just clapping. He, when, he, when he wants to go, he wants to go all, you know, he wants that full reaction. So as far as like, yeah, he can go with no quarantine, but until that restriction is changed, and also they would have to get him a visa, which is another issue. But he's probably not going to Japan that soon. But whether it's this year or, or maybe, maybe it'd be 2023, um, he, Moxley, and two other guys talked about how much they want to do G1 just to go to Japan for a month hang out with each other and have all these great matches with Tanahashi and Okada and and you know Kota Ibushi and up and down the line of all the guys who would be in G1 Will Ospreay Zach you know whatever so I don't know if that's going to happen but um they were just they were just talking about it and um you know there's, there's a lot of other a lot, a lot of other newsworthy stuff that's in the interview, so you would probably like to listen to it. Gable Stevenson. So, Big Ten finals are tomorrow. He's in the finals. Um, you know, the NCAAs will be in two weeks, so um, he's undefeated this year. He's the favorite to win the Hodge Trophy right now. Um, but, yeah, he won um, two matches today. So, finals tomorrow against uh, Tony Cassiope who's one of the top guys, but nobody's touched Gable all year. So, um, you know, he's heavy, heavy favorite to win, obviously, the Big Ten and the NCAAs. Um, if anybody beats him, it would be a huge, huge upset. And uh, ratings. So, um, let me get to that. Um, yeah, so it's just the uh, AW number, which was down uh, it didn't come out and it didn't come out until a day later because there was a problem at nielsen but it was um was it like i think 966 and 460 i believe were the numbers let me just make sure that that is correct it was uh what do i got here 966 and 460 amazing so anyway um you know it's down but you know like they said with Raw, like I said with NXT, everyone but SmackDown. And, of course, SmackDown being on a network, it's not going to be as affected by cable news. But cable news numbers were, were huge, um, you know, way, way above. Um, AEW beat everything but one NBA game, and they beat the other NBA game. Um, but they, um, you know, um, 
but it was down and cable news is probably the reason why and um you know that's just the gist but it was much lower than raw in males 18 to 49 and raw also did go against the news um and raw was down as well but um you know not as as down as aw was but that for whatever reason that's that's not unusual it always seems that um wwe is hurt by big news because everyone is it's only it's going to happen but aw seems to be hurt more um you know as far as you know why um I don't know. I mean, maybe the younger... It's weird because news hits the older viewers, but when there's big news, what happens is the older viewers are already watching the news, but when there's a big news story, you get a lot more younger viewers, and and perhaps that's what it is because AEW is so heavily concentrated with younger viewers that when something hurts the younger viewers, AEW takes a bigger hit than WWE because WWE has so many of the older viewers and the older viewers... Like like, like for... um, Raw on Monday with over fifty viewers, which is their number one audience, they were they were at the normal levels. You know, it wasn't like um, you know, I mean, they were down a little bit, because, but they weren't down that much. Whereas AEW, you know, was was down more. So anyway, that's uh, that's the deal there. I don't really like, you know, I mean, ratings for anyone, whether it was Raw or NXT um, or whatever. On a big news week, you know, don't I, I always say, like don't take them seriously because it's one of those things. I mean, um, the pay per view number is going to be interesting. I don't, does it will will that hurt the pay per view? I think probably not because the pay per view is something that people are willing to pay pay fifty dollars for. So the pay per view number is going to be again. I don't know what it'll be. Um, it's a great card. Um, it's a deep card, but I mean historically deep card whether it's ufc or professional wrestling deep card is not necessarily a big pay-per-view mover the big mover is a great main event that people can't wait to see and um you know i don't know that adam page and adam cole is that match if there is a big mover it's probably the dog collar match honestly more than anything um and it's just a question is is that enough you know is the hype of that is the angles enough to uh for that to be like a big number you know we'll wait and see they've never you know they've never had a number that didn't beat the number of the same show the year before but a year ago they did like 145,000 buys for that um um you know the uh explosive barbed wire john moxley kenny omega match and i could see this doing less i mean obviously i could see it you know doing about the same I mean, maybe slightly, slightly more because um, Full Gear did more. Um, but full, full Gear, I thought, you know, what, whatever, probably stronger marquee match. But this is a loaded show. I mean, as far as, so we'll see. I mean, um, you know, whatever. But the, the pay-per-view to me means a lot more, you know, than this week's TV rating. You know, and I'm sure the Friday rating, which I haven't heard, probably wasn't that great. Although WWE did very well on Friday night um, for Ronda and... You know, I mean, Ronda's numbers, um, you know, for the house shows and everything, you know, I mean, they they she's a draw. I mean, I, she may not be a draw in six months, but she's a draw right now. A couple of notes from uh, the SmackDown and Rampage shows before we go. Rampage's main event, the three-way. That match was great. The TNT title with Andrade and Darby and Sammy Guevara. Holy smokes, this match was awesome. And they actually did something I have never seen before. Taz has never seen before. With the suplex? Someone listening to this may have seen it before, but they did the stacked up superplex, except it was a stacked up delayed superplex, which was the craziest thing I ever saw. The place went nuts. They they didn't, yeah, like, it's like they, they, usually you just do the thing and you do the throw. Andrade walked, and, and then they had to balance on top of Andrade doing in the suplex position. That was completely I, nuts. I have never seen, I mean, it may have been done somewhere. I've never seen that before either. It was, um, but there was, I mean, it wasn't just that move, man. That match was just great. So then they uh, actually did kind of a creative finish. You, everyone, you know, you know the steal the pin finish because they did right. so absolutely they say, everywhere, they did, including they, Madison they, Square Garden. Yeah. Allen, Darby Allen hits the uh, coffin drop, but then uh, Sammy throws him out to, uh, um, let's see, what's, what happened here? He hits the move. No, 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 no. Sa- Sammy walks into the, the go, to, go to hell. Sa- Sammy does the go to hell on Andrade. Yes. 
Darby throws him out of the ring and does the coffin drop, so you think for sure he's won. Yes. But he didn't. But instead, he got... The guy who tried to steal the pin got his pin stolen. That's right. what I was getting at there. Anyway, this three was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So go out your heard, way to watch I, it. I heard, I heard from people who saw it, who, who were there live. A couple of my friends were there live. And then went and watched it later. And they said that it was way better live than even on television. They said way better, not slightly better. That's virtually impossible to believe. I know. But it was that so was, good. Yeah, yeah. That match was great. Then we had uh, Alex Abrahantes coming out with Death Triangle. And uh, this was the debut of their third guy, who is Eric Redbeard. The Vintner has returned. Yes. And uh, that sets up the six-man tag on the buy-in show. He ran wild, killed everybody, laid them all yeah, he out. Yeah, was throwing, throwing all these people around. He, um, you know what's interesting with him is that he has really good facial expressions. And I never really thought of that in WWE because, you know, he was always doing that stoic character and everything. But um, and we'll see. Um, another new guy. Man, there's, there's a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of new guys. We had uh, Dan Lambert explaining that Scorpio Sky is getting a championship match for the TNT title on Wednesday because he made Tony Khan an offer he could not refuse, which is that he is bringing Paige Van Zant to the pay-per-view on Sunday to sign her AEW deal. That's an interesting one. Um, well, dude, she's better off doing that than bare-knuckle fighting. Well, for her, fa- for her face, it's way better. Bare knuckle fighting was not the thing for her, but she was offered so much. You know, this is kind of a sad thing, in a sense, to me, is, was Paige Van Zandt and bare knuckle fighting, even though she did want to do it and everything. Um, but she was offered, like, just a great, great amount of money to do it. Um, but it's like, you know, she's a star. I mean, she was, you know, it's not like she's a great fighter in the UFC, but she was absolutely a star who could draw. And... Um, I don't know. Like, it's it's just, you know, the fact that she was doing bare-knuckle fighting, which is like, again, her big thing is her looks. I mean, that's, that's you know, every you know the big thing about her, whether it's in the future in Hollywood or whatever, or whatever future she has, or in modeling or doing her OnlyFans site or whatever it is that she's doing with her and her husband and everything. And it's like, the one thing about the bare-knuckle fighting is it's very bloody and you can mess up your face doing it so i always thought that was like maybe a short-term thing but whatever um she still may be doing another fight i think she's got one more fight left on her on that contract and you know obviously she could go to bellator but i don't know how much bellator is going to pay and aw i thought you know it's like it's she didn't do so much that like you would go like oh man it's like um but i i i thought like I was impressed. I thought that she was good, and she clearly has presence in AEW. I mean, and as far as she is an athlete, she is very pretty. Um, I mean, I would think that, you know, again, like, if you had, if you, if she was dedicated to it and wanted to train, but, man, it's it's hard, because it's a multi-year thing to learn how to wrestle, but... Um, but, if, you know, if you brought her out there, and the fact she did get a reaction, and she has a certain... You know, she does have a certain charisma to her. So it's like, I mean, I would, I mean, if you're going to take a try on an MMA female fighter, I'm not sure that, you know, I'm getting, you know, she's, she's probably worth taking the try with. So, um, but I was still surprised. Like, I'm not surprised that she would do it at all. Obviously, it was on the show and seemed to be having a good time. But I am surprised, like, signing, like, when they said they're signing her to a deal, you know, like, like as a regular. I mean, that, that just that kind of just surprised me. Keith Lee destroyed J.D. Drake and Punk did a great promo covered in blood that was recorded after the show on uh, Wednesday, hyping up the match. Just a fantastic promo. He's CM Punk. I'm better than you. Uh, this is available online if you want to check it out. It was great. And uh, Serena D beat Layla Gray quickly, 58 seconds. And then uh, Christian Cage beat Ethan Page in the uh, ladder match qualifier. So he is going to the pay-per-view on Sunday. thought this was a great Rampage show. Well, news-wise and everything, you know, with the debut and the announcement of Page and the, uh, the great opening match, 
Yeah, yeah. It was a really good show. I like SmackDown, too. I thought yeah, Rick Shea, Sami Zayn was a good match. Huge good. pop when uh, Rick Shea won the title. Uh, Johnny Knoxville. Fast Hurricane Runner, Rey Mysterio, Juventude style. Uh, Johnny Knoxville interfered, which, of course, led to... Uh, this, 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 this was Ricochet's best main roster match, don't you think? Um, I, mean, I feel I like mean, at some point he may have had a better one, but this is certainly the best one that I can remember in forever. I think it was his best. Like, I mean, he had better matches in NXT, but I thought this was his best. And, you know, Sammy's good. I mean, the only, you know, I mean, it was short. But there's like nine, maybe nine and a half minutes or something. But um, yeah, I thought this match like was really. I thought this match was really, really good. We had uh, that, of course, led to Sammy challenging um, Johnny Knoxville. Knoxville actually did a pretty good promo accepting. So that match is on for WrestleMania. He's even had his what penis broken? As we said, yeah. You just, he didn't mention his brain hemorrhage or his no. or his t- however many concussions he's had. We had Austin Theory, Pat McAfee doing a segment where they announced uh, that will be Pat McAfee's opponent at WrestleMania. So uh, it's a pretty good segment. Uh, Pat McAfee was great, uh, calling out Theory to come back when he wouldn't. Naomi yeah, beat so, so Austin. So, so Austin Theory slapped him in the face and then left, and then McAfee just was screaming at him to come back. Yeah, Pat McAfee was really good in the in the segment for sure. We had uh, Naomi beating Carmella. Uh, just a quick match. Uh, Sasha Banks interfered when Vega tried to interfere and then uh, Naomi hit the split legged moonsault for the pin we had a happy Corbin Madcap Moss segment where uh, they're laughing about Wrestlemania and everything they're, they're, like that playing, and making fun they're, of Drew McIntyre they're playing, they're playing poker yep. with, so, a bunch of, with, with a bunch of extras so uh, Drew beats Jinder in two minutes and then he uh, calls out uh, Happy Corbin, vows to end his streak at WrestleMania, which uh, we've talked about this before, but since when does Happy Corbin have a winning streak? He's undefeated. No, he's not. I know he's Fucking not. Fucking ridiculous. I, but they say he is. I realize Well, that. they mean, they need, they need, look. Okay, I, I'm not, you know... No, he's not undefeated. I don't know why they're saying it. They believe they have a creative license and everything like that. But the thing is, is I think that they know that um, people wanted to see Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania against somebody else. But the storyline is this guy. Because even, you know, even on social media where these guys, you know, I mean, they never criticized the booking. And he didn't either. But he did go like, I understand all you people really upset that I'm wrestling Corbin at WrestleMania. I couldn't believe he said that, but he actually said that, you know, and it's just like, it's just like, um, I mean, he didn't say like, I am too, because, because then he'd get in trouble, but he absolutely acknowledged it. The fact he acknowledged it at all kind of, you know, it's, it's, you know, pretty much says something, but, um, I mean, they had nobody else. I mean, when you, the thing, it's so funny that they have a million people under contract and then all of a sudden it's like, who's our number two baby face on SmackDown? <laughs> and it's like, we don't have one. <laughs> let's, let's put Ricochet over because for whatever reason, Big E's a tag team guy and Shinsuke Nakamura's a tag team guy now. So it's like number one baby face is Drew McIntyre. So we need a number two baby face, and it's freaking a guy who they've been burying as recently as like a couple of weeks ago. Um, and and then like with uh, McIntyre, who's you know in theory the number one. I mean, probably as far as baby faces go, with the exception of Brock Lesnar, who's part time. I mean, he's probably the number one baby face in the whole company on the men's side. Right now, um, you know, even though people cheer Roman Reigns, but I mean, he's technically a heel and he's wrestling Corbin at WrestleMania because and it's not it's because it's they have nothing else. It's just like it's like they've got a million guys that are so talented, but everyone's slotted in a certain way. And yeah, there they're, there you go. We had a Roman Reigns promo hyping up the uh, big Madison Square Garden show, man. I really hyped that thing up. And he vowed to beat uh, Lesnar at WrestleMania. Usos beat the Viking Raiders. That was quick. Yeah. What a... I, I gotta, gotta say this. Usos-Viking Raiders feud. So this is probably the match that they were planning for um, for Saudi. Because the Saudi match was um, was supposed to happen. They, they ran low on time. So um, they did what they did. 
Um, but, you know, so this was the pay-per-view match, and it was... Eight minutes. Yeah. Um, you know, and these guys are both real. you know, both teams are good, but they just, they just, you know, made the Viking Raiders out to be, like, not on their level in almost every turn. We well, were supposed to have Big E and Sheamus, but uh, no match as uh, the heels attacked him, and then Ridge Holland grabbed a chair and destroyed the ATV. Dang. Which, if you remember what happened last week on the show, I mean, he was totally in the right here. I mean, they tried to they run tried that run guy over. over. Yeah, you can't do that. So he destroyed the ATV, smashed it, and uh, they they kept pointing out that Kofi had bought him this ATV as a birthday gift. What a friend. I I thought this was too quick in the sense of, I mean, you knew when he had the ATV, okay? You knew that... They were going to sell him, gonna... and they are. That's true. Yeah, no, but I mean, you knew that they were going to bash it in. like like. But I thought, like, you get it over, you know, you get it over for a while, and then you bash it in. It's like, they bashed it in week two. Yeah, they don't waste time. Yeah. Well, I guess it had to do, you know, maybe that's going to be a WrestleMania match. You know, um, New Day against... Uh, um, you know, Sheamus and Ridge Holland just because, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it is, I mean, they're doing the tag match on SmackDown. So, um, next week. So it's not like it's saved for WrestleMania, but maybe something from that tag match will, you know, go to wrestle, you know, build something to WrestleMania. So they're doing that. Yeah. So. So then, uh, main event was, uh, Ronda and Sonya Deville, Charlotte, uh, distraction. Sonya Deville got a little heat. Match only went three minutes. Uh, Piper's pit, armbar finish. And then Ronda challenged Charlotte to get in the ring. And, in fact, Charlotte got in the ring, and Ronda put her in the uh, ankle lock, and Flair furiously tapped. And uh, the story they're telling is she has she has two moves, everybody. Yeah. I thought Ronda looked good. I mean, for three minutes. Ronda Rousey is not a one-trick pony, you see. Yes. She has two moves. You know her big... It's you know the fucking big ridiculous. Thing. The big thing with Ronda Rousey is her new... She's being marketed as the hot mama. Yes, I saw that on her shirt. Yes, they're they're selling those shirts and everything now. Yes. Wow. Yep. I think got to make some money. Got to sell something to all those hot mamas out there. Yep. All right, we're out of time, everybody. Well, real quick, New Japan Cup. Oh, yeah. It's, okay, so here's the update on the New Japan Cup very quickly. So, um... Did you watch, did you watch the Budokan? I have not seen Budokan, no. Okay, so, um... Budokan show is really good. I mean, not like you got to see it. It's spectacular, one of these great shows. But it's pretty much, I mean, there was um, the Toriano match sucked. But um, most of the matches were, were well-wrestled, fun matches. And I guess the, the three big ones that I would say to go out of your way to see, Goto and Nagata, was, it was one of those. The thing is, all three of these matches... I mean, they're they're all good, even in the form that they're in. But the thing that is kind of in a, in a weird way sad is like these all three in, in for for somewhat similar reasons were matches that the crowd, if there was cheering and booing, these matches would have gotten over great. Because the one thing that always works with New Japan is when you have someone who's sort of sympathetic that people really want to see do good, and then you give them a ton of offense and you tease like they're going to get this big upset, even though uh, most of the time, in almost every case, they don't get it. And that's what happened here. But, like, Goto sold so much for Nagata, and I was just like, this match would get over so big. Like, when Nagata was in G1, like, many years ago, his last G1, when he would have all those four-and-a-half-star matches and everything all through the tournament. And this was very similar but without the great crowd reaction, it wasn't quite as good. But, you know, that freaking Yuji Nagata, 50, almost 54 years old, he was great. Uh, then the next one was um, Tanahashi and um, Yo. And it was the same thing where the whole match was, oh, my God, Yo's, you know, got near fall after near fall after near fall. And you know he's not going to win, but he's doing so well. I mean, that match would have gotten over great. Plus, it was so well wrestled. I mean, um, you know, it, it just, it was one of those things where the actual technical wrestling aspect of it was tremendous. I loved that match. And then Okada Desperado, you know, probably with the crowd, that match is going to be match of the year. Because, again, Okada sold a lot for him. And Okada also looked, whatever it is, you know, like Okada... 
you know, okada has been dealing with injuries and he, he seems he moved the healthiest that I've seen him move in a long time. Like that drop kick was back to being the old Okada drop kick, not that lower version because he's got the bad back and the slip disc and everything um, and the neck and everything. I mean, he just Okada was was, um, you know, just really moved well. And he's fantastic when he's in a big match and Desperado is actually fantastic in a big match. So that's, um, I mean, it's still, I would say Okada Desperado is among the better matches of the year. You know, I wouldn't say match of the year candidate, but it's, it was, um, it was tremendous. So then tonight. All right. So here are the results for today. Uh, Kotobushi forfeit. So great. Okan moves on. He faces Taichi Ishimori next. We had uh, Zack Sabre Jr. beating Ryohei Oiwa, so he'll be facing Doki next. We had uh, Hanare, Aaron Hanare, beat uh, Yuto Nakashima, so he'll face Sonata next. Uh, Bushi and Will Ospreay, obviously Will Ospreay won that match. He faces El Fantasmo in the Will next Ospreay, round. W- Will Ospreay and Fantasmo might be a fantastic match. It should be a fantastic match. Yeah, I mean, that's that's super talented guys. And, you know, they both... You know, again, they both worked in the same places and things like that. And, um, yeah, so, um, but yeah, tonight's show, not too, I mean, like, so the show tonight has uh, probably the biggest match in the first round as far as on paper with Ishii and Shingo Takagi. We got Ishii and Shingo Takagi, winner faces Tonga Loa. Chase Owens and Jado, the winner faces Tiger Mask. Taguchi and Evil, winner gets Tamatanga. And Hiromu and Sho with the unfortunate winner getting Minoru Suzuki. Hiromu and Sho's a good is, is a is a good one. And then whoever wins with Minoru Suzuki will probably be a a great match. So that's the lineup for the New Japan Cup, everybody. And uh, as noted, we're out of time. Tomorrow we'll be back after the Revolution pay per view. So Dave and I'll cover that. Vinny and I covering it as well. So lots of stuff coming up tomorrow. Check it out. And that's it, everybody. We'll talk to you again after a while.